you did a new article just put up on fortheblogie.com. That's fortheblogie.com, and I recommend you guys uh, bookmark it. Great site with some great articles like the one that Shane just put up, and it's titled, What Does New Offensive Coordinator Andy Kotelnicki Need to Fix with the uh, Penn State Offense? Well, just quickly in general, Shane, what do they need to fix? Above all else, um, what sticks out is the explosive plays. Um, you know, Nick Singleton and, and Katron Allen were ripping off 75, 80-yard runs uh, a year ago, and those kind of seemed to diminish. Um, I mentioned in the article it's kind of easy to scream and shout and grab the pitchforks for, you know, more explosive plays. Um, but I'm sure we'll get into it. There's a couple small schematic things that they can change um, that can lead to that. I think when you look at the averages over the last – three to five years, they are down. Um, so just more offense. Well, let's start where you did in your article with something you call the quick game. Before telling us how to fix that, can you describe what it is for our listeners first? Sure. So anytime a quarterback drops back to pass, uh, contrary to popular belief, it is not referred to as a drop back pass, at least in, uh, in my world. Um, there's things called there's quick game, there's true drop back, uh, there's shot plays, there's screen plays, and, you know, yes, there there's a ball being thrown in all those, but what kind of differentiates them is uh, a lot of times footwork and pass protection. So with quick game specifically, uh, some coaches will coach like a, a quick three, so one, two, three, hit, hit your back foot and, and let it go. Gersic does the, suff- the shuffle drop. So I mean, when I'm watching games, anytime I see a shuffle drop, uh, I know they're working quick game. Uh, so that essentially means the quarterback will kind of take a shuffle. His feet and shoulders will be aligned to his target. Um, and you try to to kind of structure these plays so that uh, as soon as the quarterback uh, sets his feet, uh, the first receiver is starting to come open. Well, then it also sounds like when you're getting the ball out quickly, this is what James Franklin was talking about, what he was pushing for, which is those easy, quick passes for the quarterback. And he wasn't seeing that. So it sounds like he was in agreement with you. So explain to us now, how do they fix that? The philosophy of quick game should be to get a quarterback in rhythm, get them easy completions, get their confidence up, kind of get them into the flow of the game. Uh, And also, you know, there's a lot of big plays that can happen when you get the ball in in receivers and running backs, tight ends, hands early. Um, So how do they fix it? I'm not a power five offensive coordinator, but what I would do, uh, is start by adding some motion in it. Uh, I had to go back to last year to find the clip of when they added some motion to quick game. And essentially what that does is cleans up the read so much for the quarterback right before the snap. So say it could be as easy that easy as I have a running back sidecar beside me. We send him in a tear motion out the other way. Uh, and if somebody runs with him, great. Now there's a lot of vacated space in the middle. Uh, we can throw a little spot or hitch route right there and it's kind of an easy six yards minimum um so it's kind of doing things like that that allow the read to free up immediately um, and create vacated space now uh you also talked about in the drop back type and i think we could all figure out what that means is using an empty set and that would assist the quarterback also and i think that's actually what drew aller did a lot of when he was in high school Explain yeah. how an empty set would help him out. Sure. So I'm a huge, huge fan of empty. I always lobby for it. Um, and I think a lot of coordinators kind of stray away from it because they don't trust their quarterback because uh, there's two open edges. You have five in pass protection, and you have to rely on them to be able to make the correct uh, protection adjustments and see all the free runners. So a good measuring stick of that is how many times was Drew Aller you know, completely blindsided by a nickel off the edge or a plus one, as we say, off the edge. I can't think of an example personally. Um, so what advantages does it provide? It kind of forces the defense to show their hand. So there's a couple tells. Uh, the one I mentioned in the article is, you know, they have to they have to show their pressure. That or uh, it's going to take forever for them to get home because think about it. If the nickel is lined up, you know, all the way out on the hash uh, over top of the slot receiver, if he's going to blitz, he's got to start creeping up to the line or it's going to take him, you know, five, 10 seconds to get home. Uh, and by that time, the ball should be out. So that that's helpful, too. 
And what you also talked about, what I thought was particularly intriguing is once you start spreading out like that, you're obviously you're going to create some mismatches where a linebacker most likely has to cover somebody and create an obvious mismatch. Right. So the the key in empty, so empty, you're going to have three eligibles on one side or, or four, but for the most part, it's going to be three and two. The number two on the weak side, which is the slot on the two-man side, will almost always have a favorable matchup because obviously with your nickel on the field, you want to put him to the passing strength, which is going to be the three-man side. So the slot receiver on the two-man side will always have a linebacker on him or a safety, but most of the time's a linebacker. Uh, and if your slot receiver can't win that matchup, then you got you got bigger problems. And the last part you uh, talked about was something called the third level RPOs. Again, just a quick description of what that means first before talking about how that could help out this offense. Sure. So I'm sure by now everyone's familiar with a run pass option in RPO. Um, every announcer likes to call every run and every pass that involves any sort of, of run fake in RPO. Um, but so th- there's kind of three different categories of them, at least how I, how I like to separate them. There's the first level. So if you're making a read off the defensive end, so Penn state does this one a lot where they'll send a tight end to the flat. Um, and if he crashes hard, then they'll pop it out to the flat. Uh, if he doesn't, then they'll run an inside zone concept. Um, and then there's a second level, uh, RPOs, which I don't think your sitch ran much of those which would kind of be if uh, if an outside linebacker fits the run, you might throw like a quick in or a quick slant uh, into his vacated area. Um, but a more popular one uh, is a third-level RPO. So a lot of defenses in these two safety structures, uh, the safeties have run-fitting responsibilities. So they'll have to trigger on any run action um, to their side or sometimes even away. And what that does is free up space where they were. So... Uh, the popular route that kind of takes advantage of this is the glance route. Um, I put a couple clips in the article, but essentially like a skinny post, uh, a bang eight, uh, whatever you want to call it. But what this does is is force safeties to hesitate and kind of play both. Um, and I think that is where the explosive runs can come in because so many times I remember watching games this year and thinking, man, they are one hairline fracture away from from breaking this thing down the sideline. So when you can consistently stress a safety uh, with a glance being thrown behind his eardrum, uh, you know, they're forced to, to kind of hesitate a little. 